Okay, we finished the book of Daniel last, uh, last week, so we'll start a new series today. And I just simply give it a title, Who is a Jesus Today? Okay? We'll try. I don't know how many teachings we'll come up with on this one, but we'll start today with who is this Jesus that we celebrate? Because, because uh, today is Christmas Eve, um, and uh, tomorrow is Christmas Day. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of information regarding Christmas is lost. Uh, in Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 13, verse 8, it reads very clearly that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, you will, you will read that in all of the Assemblies of God churches. The moment uh, you enter Assemblies of God church in their, in their, in their altar, in their platform, at the top, uh, you, you will read that. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, we went to a uh, bond talk in, in uh, the mountain province last time, and we, don't, we, we really don't know whether it was Assemblies of God or not, but because there is that inscription of Hebrews 13, 8, I assume it was Assemblies of God. And certainly, it was Assemblies of God. Because they're assuming, well, they believe, not assuming, that uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, think about that. If Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then it follows that his word is also the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that correct? Okay. So if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that means that whatever he did yesterday, he can do today, and he will do tomorrow. Will that be a correct statement? Okay. But somewhere along the translation, some things are lost. For example, some, some, people, some denominations believe that uh, Jesus Christ doesn't heal anymore today. Therefore, if Jesus Christ doesn't heal anymore today, then Jesus Christ, is, Jesus Christ is no longer the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Okay? But that, that simple change in belief system changes a lot of what we believe and how we live today. Now, <clears throat> I ask the question, who is Jesus that we celebrate? Because to be honest, I, I really don't know what, what kind of, of uh, Jesus all of us here celebrate. Okay? Before, the Democrats before uh, championed don't greet Merry Christmas anymore. I just, just greet Happy Holidays. And a lot of us, including, including most of you, how do I know most of you? Because the cards that I receive from this church doesn't say anymore Merry Christmas. It says Happy Holidays. That means you agree with the Democrats. Um, your theology is affected. But then Trump became president. And he, what's funny about that is he said, it's okay to say Merry Christmas. As if, as if he has to, to uh, pacify everybody. It's really okay to say Merry Christmas. Now, of course, uh, people are mixed and more, more cards are out there uh, greeting Merry Christmas. But that transition shows to us that there is a change, and maybe the Jesus that other people are celebrating is not the same Jesus that we are celebrating. Maybe they have the same name, okay? I don't know if one of them has a last name. I think one of them has a last name in the Philippines. It's Kibuloi, you know? So they, they celebrate him now perhaps because he's the most, according to him, he's the most important person in the world today. But things are changing, and if we will not be careful, we may end up celebrating a different person. Because the moment you agree that certain things are different now, then you're celebrating a different person. And uh, it may not be the same Jesus that we are celebrating. So let's, uh, let's look at that, okay? Let's, let's read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and try to uh, see that from a biblical perspective. This is a brief narration of the birth of Jesus. By the way, Bethlehem is occupied by the Palestinians. So if you have seen pictures of uh, Bethlehem today, there are no uh, Christmas lights <laughs> uh, because of the war with the Hamas. 
and so there, there is no festivity there. And they believe that uh, that is exactly where Jesus was born. And uh, close by, uh, that uh, church in Bethlehem, uh, if you just climb in one of the buildings, you, you will look at one of the, uh, uh, like a prairie type grazing ground. They say that is where the shepherds were when uh, Jesus was born. But no festivities right now in Bethlehem, okay? Matthew 1, verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. To her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and not waiting, wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But, but after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, so that's very clear. The mission of Christ is to save us from our sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what, this, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did... <clears throat> As the Lord's angel had commanded him, he married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Look, look at that uh, particle there, the until. But did not have sexual relation with her until she gave birth. So what happened after she gave birth? She had sexual, he had sexual relationship with her. So the teaching that it's a perpetual virginity. It's just not in the scriptures. And he named him uh, Jesus. Now, <clears throat> as to the question of who is the Jesus that we celebrate today, well, first let's, let's look at the transitions. There are, there are different, uh, different answers to this one. And, and let's see where, where our background is coming from. Well, for that question, the first, the first major influence that we have is what we call as uh, Western pluralism. Okay, that's, we have discussed that before, pluralism. But it's a simple belief system uh, which is very cultural. They say that faith is very private and personal. That's just the way it is. Bill Clinton is the one, I think, who, who uh, really made it very famous when he said, well, I'm a Christian, but separate my, my faith, my religion from my public life. It's just a private thing. All of our belief system is just private. And a lot of people are very happy about that. However, that's contrary to the Bible. Because the Bible says we are supposed to live by faith and not by sight. Okay? We live by faith. Uh, when you say you live by faith, you live your life actually with others. Nobody lives alone. I mean, even hermits live with some, some creatures, you know. Uh, they may not like people, but there are animals around them. But we are social creatures. And, uh, and to live by faith requires how we conduct our lives in front of others. So now, uh, pluralism doesn't, uh, secular uh, pluralism doesn't like that. He said, whoa, what, what about in business? You know, what, what if uh, I pay my taxes? I will, I will make less money. I told you about that uh, multi-billion peso company that was established uh, in the Philippines on how to make your skin uh, whiter. And it's making, making tons of money right now. But uh, Willie and Mon was part of that inception. And they separated because those Chinese don't want to pay taxes. Do you know that most of the business transactions in the Philippines right now uh, that is being done, the taxes are not being paid in the Philippine government. It's being paid to China. 
you know, the, uh, how do you call that, the Alibaba scheme, wherein they will charge their credit card. The interest rate, all the taxes are being paid directly to China, not in the Philippines. It's a, it's a very clear tax evasion thing. And so, how about that? Uh, well, I'm a Christian, but because I want to make money, forget about, forget about uh, my faith right now. By the way, that's, we, we may not be aware of it, but uh, when we live by faith, that means you live by the word of the Lord, by what God says. But a lot of us have made choices that will directly uh, be opposing what we believe. You, know? the, uh, you, will, you will remember the sister of the poor a few years ago. They, they refused to give contraceptives and do abortions, so they were sued. And, and finally they won, and then they were sued again. I, I don't know what happened in the case now. But because the, the argument is, this is our choice. This is private, private, uh, private uh, religion, private faith. I am a Christian, but I would like to kill my baby, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Well, the, the problem with that, it's very erroneous, because then what about the sisters of the poor? What about their nurses? What about their doctors? Well, this is our faith. We, we cannot kill babies. And what they say is, uh, forget your faith. It doesn't matter. It's what we believe that matters. So that is, that is Western uh, pluralism. And, and you have to, when, when you are separating your private life to your faith life, that's pluralism, okay? The second is, in, is uh, what we call as simply as secularism. Perhaps this is a, the, one of the most dangerous uh, thing, because for many people, in, 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 a, in secularism, faith becomes unnecessary and insignificant. A lot of Hollywood actors and actresses believe this. They, they uh, laugh at people who uh, talk about faith and Jesus and God because they believe that uh, their lives are backwards and they follow myths. I told you the last interview I saw about this was uh, the actor for uh, Captain America. He was, uh, he was laughing, saying, you know, this is 21st century, and so everybody who believes that there is still God uh, are just backwards and deranged mentally. And some, some Hollywood uh, personalities are actually like that. And so they think that it's very superstitious. That is uh, secularism. Now, the other thing is this. People will not put it in, but I put it in. Anti-Semitism. You know, it's, uh, when Jesus was born, he was not born as a Filipino. Okay, you know that. He was born as a Jewish. I mean, a full-blooded Jewish citizen. His mom and his uh, adopted father are 100% Jewish, both uh, coming from the line of David. So Joseph, the carpenter, Mary, the wife, are both from the line of David. You say, what's the relevance of, of that? Well, look. In anti-Semitism, not only don't they like the Jews, a lot of them believe that a lot of the problems that we have came from them. And so, you cannot be anti-Semitic and not anti-Jesus. Now listen, because anti-Semitism is growing, that means anti-Jesus is going to continue to grow. Now, if anti-Jesus will be growing, that means anti-Christianity will be growing also. That's the, the, so if that is the case, then uh, who will celebrate Christmas? When, when, I will, when I first came here to Chicago, they, they drove me around, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, Sogunash area. I don't know if, if that was really the community. And they told me, Pastor Jose will drive you at night at, at this community, I think Sogunash. I said, why? because of the Christmas decorations, the Christmas lights. I don't know if it's Sogunash or somebody, some community close by. Well, try to drive around now, see if there's a lot of Christmas decorations. The more anti-Semitic the world gets, the more we will celebrate this. By the way, that's biblical, because uh, after all of this said and done, the first major gift giving and gift exchange that will take place is after the two witnesses are slaughtered in the, during the Great Tribulation. Uh, once they were killed by the, by the Antichrist, people will be giving gifts to each other and celebrating. We call it, in theology, 
anti-Christmas celebration. Okay, but, but uh, more and more. And uh, I was watching a presentation the other day. The, the best Christmas celebrating country on, on earth. And I forgot what country was that. I think it's, it's Iceland or New Zealand or something like that. But some remote place where nobody lives, you know. And, and the decorations were very festive. Uh, very far from those who always cry out that they are Christians. And so the more, the more this, anti look, there's war going on in Israel against Hamas. And a lot of the world right now is going against Israel. Well, then they are going against the Jews. They're going to go against Jesus. That's the effect of that. The other thing is, is, uh, that affects the way we answer that question is our history as a, as a church, Christian history. You know, sad, sad to say, Christian history is filled with a lot of challenges and sufferings. By the way, the 19th century, if you will remember in your history classes, it's, they, they call it uh, the Christian century. The reason why they call it Christian century is because Europe was predominantly Christian. I mean, Germany was Christian. England was Christian. I mean, almost everybody is Christian. The, the one guarding, can you imagine this? The one guarding Orthodox Christianity. Anybody wants to guess who guards Orthodox Christianity during the Christian century? Give me a guess. Don't, don't say that, that's too general. What country, that, what, what country uh, uh, protects Orthodox Christianity in Europe? Come on. See if you can guess. I'll give you pre toothpick, okay? After the eating time. <laughs> what's, what's, what country is that? Anybody remember? Russia. Russia was protecting Orthodox Christianity. Yeah? The Tsars. That's why when the Tsars was overthrown, Stalin took over, it turns upside down. And Germany is protecting Christianity also. The Lutherans. <clears throat> and, so, and so there was a belief, and some of you have heard this term perhaps, they call it millennialism, the millennials. They believe that the world is now going to get better and better and better and it will usher in the second return of the Lord. Or some people believe Jesus has already returned. We don't know where they are, where he is, but he already returned. But, but then the czars were overtaken. And then the first world war took place. And then the second world war took place. And then a lot of the atrocities of the so-called Christian nations came to light, the abuses and all of those things. So all of the good image being portrayed collapsed, okay? A lot of people don't want to be Christians anymore during that time. And so, uh, the, the, one of the biggest Christian countries in the world uh, is America, and we, su we, uh, we supply missionaries at one point. Around 90% of missions, missionaries came from the U.S. But we are the country who detonated two atom bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. After those bombs were detonated, the world became hopeless. There is, there is a surge of hopelessness that took place because now the question is this, is there hope for humanity? Can you imagine if we can detonate an A-bomb? It can annihilate, annihilate the world. There's, there's, an, there's a bomb, I don't know how they call it. I read it from uh, uh, Citizens Magazine when I was in elementary. It was republished when I was in high school. And when I was in college, my, my siblings were reading it also. There was supposedly a bomb that the U.S. Uh, designed that they cannot uh, try. They say this bomb is so powerful, it will split the whole earth in two. So they, they, they are very scared. They, they don't want to detonate the bomb. And I, I read the article more than once. I started reading it when I was in elementary, I read it in high school, and I was in college. I read the thing. And I don't know how true it is, but if, if you have news like that, when, when Soviet Union collapsed, when the Berlin Wall collapsed, uh, the CIA found out in Virginia alone, the state of Virginia, there were something like 500 nuclear warheads pointed at, 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 at the state of Virginia. A lot of them are pointed at Pentagon 
and, uh, and the White House. 500 uh, nuclear warheads. Now, you, you look at this, the U.S. has thousands of it. And we have, we have television uh, movie productions <clears throat> that talks about the possibility of it being, being detonated inland. You look at that, think, think with, level with me on this one, if you are a natural man and you have no spiritual outlook, is there really hope? You know, uh, Woodrow Wilson tried to find, to uh, establish the League of Nations, it did not succeed, and another uh, abysmal failure is the United Nations, because it's anti-God and anti-Christian. And so, you, you look at that and you say, is there really hope for mankind? Well, if there is no hope in spite of the gospel and the Christianity that went all over the world and the charitable works, what is it that, that we need to do? And so hopelessness begin to, uh, to set in. Now, when the other question that you have to ask is this. When human sufferings are taking place and violence, where are the Christians? You've heard of the Crusades, uh, that is uh, the campaign by European kings, monarchs, to uh, reclaim the promised land from the, from the Muslims. And it had, it had killed, we don't know how many, hundreds of thousands of Muslims. And uh, it's in the name of Christianity. So now Christianity has seen as very violent, okay? And uh, let's take, for example, the current war in, in Ukraine. What about the attack of Hamas on Israel? And remember what I, I told you, the republished letter done by Yigdal Levine? In all of this, the, the biggest Christian leaders in the world, the biggest Christian nations, did not say anything to condemn the atrocities done by the Hamas. Christian leaders. And so now the... The Jews are, are asking, well, we, we thought you're our greatest friends. You did not say anything in protest. So it seems like, well, it doesn't seem like Christianity is losing power as far as influence in the world is concerned. Now, another thing that will affect our celebration is this, and if we are celebrating the same Jesus. What about the current religious developments and cultural shift. Because there are shifts taking place right now. Um, for example, in the realm of progressivism and, and morality, we're talking about LGBTQ. Uh, the, uh, at the end of this year, I was saying last Friday, at the end of this year, December 31st is the deadline for any Methodist church who wants to, to separate from from the United Methodist Movement to file their request. This is over same-sex marriage, okay? It is the biggest split in the history of the church. Before there will be religions who will split, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, 500 churches will leave, 400 churches will leave. This is around 8,000 churches. One out of every four Methodist churches left the black churches, the black Methodist churches have not made their moves yet. And there's a lot of black Methodist churches. What will happen if the black Methodist churches decided to leave also? Now, what's, what, what's going on here? You see? This is over a doctrine of same-sex marriage because in the Bible, uh, homosexuality is an abomination to the Lord. And a lot of, a lot of Christians don't want to use the term abomination. Uh, I don't know what term they will come up with, but it's the term that my Bible used. It's an abomination before the Lord. Now, listen, why is it that the Methodist church is split? Is it because of same-sex marriage? The answer is no. It is not allowed still in the, in the Methodist church for same-sex marriage. There is no policy like that. However, for the last six years or four years, they have been trying to make it, to, to pass it. For the last six years, they have been trying to pass it. Every time they have a national conference, it won't pass. Majority of the Methodists are, are conservatives and they, had, they have the policy, one minister, one vote. Majority of Methodist ministers are Africans and Asians, and they are all conservatives, oh, especially the Africans. They are all conservatives, so they refuse to vote on it, okay? So now, the reason why they are asking the conservatives to separate is so that what will be left 
are the liberals and the progressives. So when the liberals and progressives are left, they are thinking that next year's national conference, they will once again propose a resolution allowing same-sex marriage. And they say it will pass. But by the way, while it is still illegal, a lot of bishops and a lot of their ministers are already uh, marrying homosexuals, okay? But last week, uh, the Catholic Pope uh, ag approved the blessing of same-sex couples. Call him same. Now, he said, all the bishops, all the priests can bless same-sex couples. But short of same-sex marriage, because it will take them around 50 years to debate on this thing, but can you imagine, now the Catholic Church are saying, you priests, you bishops, you can now bless same-sex couples. Now, this is a big problem. If the mainline Christian churches are doing that, what they used to believe 100 years ago, they don't believe now. So for them, Jesus Christ is no longer the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, look at this. Why will I follow a faith movement that changes its faith every time culture changes. I, I will not follow that. I mean, if you will follow that, it's your problem. But how can I follow that? Well, they say, well, culture has changed. Yeah, but God doesn't change. If God doesn't change, His word changes. Uh, his word doesn't change also. And if His word doesn't change, His view on humanity, sin, and everything else, Never change. It's us who is changing. But every time we change, we want God to change. So now we become the gods. Because if God will adjust to us, we become the gods. That is a big, big problem. And so, uh, our, 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 our mainline denominations have effectively uh, just announced to everybody, what we have is just like a religion, just like everybody else. Now, can you imagine, when we were starting this church, I was being encouraged by the leaders. Most of the leaders who came with me, they already left, okay? When we started this church, I told them, no, let's not start a church. I, I said, why do we need to start a church? You need, you need a, well, pastor said we need, we need a strong teaching in the Word of God. I said, go to Moody. There's, there's a lot of churches here that can, get, that can teach very well. Well, we want a strong worship. I said, look, a lot of churches here, they have their band, they have accomplished musicians playing in their, uh, in their worship. I said, they have better music than us. Because why, um, my idea is, why in the world will, will we have a church if there's, there are tons of churches already? It doesn't make sense. You know what other, the other thing that doesn't make sense to me? Is how can, how can somebody who is baptized in the Baptist tradition uh, or in the Methodist tradition or in any Christian traditions who got born again, how come when they come to our church and we have water baptism, they want to be baptized again? Because I will ask, why will I baptize you again? You have been baptized already. Well, it's different. Why is it different? It's the same water. Unless you spit on your water first, you know. But it's the same water. But, but we don't really believe in each other anymore. And so if that is the case, then there is no standard. You can choose whatever religion you want. It's just like choosing soda. You can choose either Pepsi or Coke. Uh, but of course, you know my preference. I like Coke, you know. Uh, brother really likes Pepsi. So <clears throat> with all of this, the hopelessness begins to set in. you know, Because you need to be able to to grasp, grasp something. Years ago, there was a, there was a uh, proposal in the Philippine legislative branch. One, one lawmaker in the Philippines suggested that marriage should now be contractual. It expires every three years, okay? Can you imagine? <laughs> Filipinos are really unique, you know, in that sense. Uh, they don't like divorce, but they want marriage with expiration date, you know. If you sleep with your wife after three years, it's expired. <laughs> that's, that's what they want. Of course, it did not pass. But can you imagine a marriage with expiration date? That's how bad it is. But can you imagine a faith 
with expiration date. But that's what's happening. It's producing, it's producing uh, how do you call it? confusion in the body of Christ. That's why I, 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 like, I like the fact that uh, we just teach the Bible. You know? for, for years I have been wanting to put something as a sign. I would like to put there Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, even if we are not Assemblies of God, because I like the verse. But I, don't, I, I just don't have enough motivation, perhaps. There are other verses I would like to. And because churches have turned into a religion. For some churches, they have become a concert hall. Uh, they could no longer have the glory of the Lord. So now we have churches with uh, disco lights, the probing dance lights. Now there are, there are churches, there is no more glory of the Lord there. So they have smoke machines, you know. Well, I have attended some of those churches. Uh, why? Well, I didn't know they have, they have a smoke machine. Now, there are some pastors now that to get inspiration, they smoke marijuana before going to the service. They say it makes them more inspired. They, they see visions and dreams. Of course, you are hallucinating, you know. So, <laughs> you see what we are doing with Christianity? We are, we are uh, pushing it away and away from the Bible, you know. And so what we have now is we, be, we are becoming superstitious. We're becoming mythical and magical, you know. I, I don't know how many people told me, Pastor, say, pray for me. I said, why? I thought you already prayed for that. Oh, your, your, your prayer is more powerful. You're closer to God. Where in the world did you get that? You know, we, we have the same closeness to God. We have the same God. We have the same faith. But we come up with myths, you know. So uh, we, have, we have people here before who attended the church. That's why there's a lot of things I stop because people say because I'm very logical. Well, maybe, perhaps, but I just don't like it because we have, we have some members before and they were telling me how glorious their church services are because during the altar call, their pastor, their pastor was a Filipino. He's dead already. So he will say, okay, we're having an altar call. Take your positions. Can you imagine having an altar call? Take your positions. So everybody will take their positions in the altar. I don't know what positions they are. But because when the pastor touches you, you're supposed to fall down. If you don't fall down, you're out of position, you know. These are the nonsense that take place. Oh, I, I like this. I was newly born again. When you're newly born again, you're, 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 you're ignorant and stupid at the same time. You really don't know what, all you know is Jesus is Lord, that's it. We have this Australian Pentecostal, and they call him a prophet. Now, I, I don't know what, what all of that was in those days. So he, he asked everybody to, uh, to uh, line up, and he will pray for it. He lay hands on everybody. Everybody fell down. I'm just everybody fell down. So I was watching, and he keeps looking at everybody, you know, with that with that stern face. And the first time he laid hands on somebody that did not fall, he prophesied to him. Boy, it was bad. He prophesied like he's the devil himself, you know. Oh, you have sins and this, I'm just itemizing sin. I said, Whoa, this is this is big. And so the guy, the guy was shocked himself that he's got all those sins that he doesn't even know. And so, so to, to, to stop the preacher from talking, from prophesying, he just fell down. I said, now I was newly born. I said, wow, powerful. I said, the guy got convicted. Now, you know, my habit, my habit is not like most of you. You, you come late. I don't, you know. What I do is I, I come first to the church. I pray. If I think I have sins, I already confess my sins so that during the worship time, I'm, I'm free in the spirit. So I will, I will just, so I've already confessed my sins. So I went to the altar because I, I did not fall. I mean, I wish I was the one who laid hands on him. You know, so he, he fell down. I, I did not fall. I did not feel any power. For you to fall down, unless, unless you have vegetable knees, uh, some force has got to be applied, you know. And I was nothing. I did not fall. 
the preacher began to prophesy to me about horrendous sins. I fell down. <laughs> I just want him to stop, you know, because I said, what is this? So we became magical now. We don't, we don't know. We have forgotten how to operate in faith. We live by faith, not by what our physical senses dictates. That's what sight means. We live by faith, not by what our physical senses dictates. But we become very sensual. That's why we, we, uh, we begin, oh, I, I feel the spirit. We even have a song that I really don't like. Oh, I feel it in my hand. What do you feel in your hand? You know, I feel it in my feet. I feel it in my head. What do you feel? I mean, when you came here, do you feel something? You know, a little bit, you will feel something. You will feel hungry. Especially when, <laughs> when you start uh, smelling some food being heated. For some people who want to display their food before the service is over, they will come down and reheat their food. Don't, let, don't you let me catch you, okay? I will illegalize your food. But, but some people are like that. They just, they just live by their feeling. Well, that's not the case, you see. But a lot of Christians, a lot of us have become like that, you know. We, that, that's why, look at our demeanor when we pray. Uh, how, how do you pray? My Bible tells me, I lift up my eyes to the Lord. You know what we do? We close our eyes to the Lord. Uh, we sing the song, uh, open my eyes, Lord, I want to see Jesus, with, I, with our eyes closed. <laughs> how do you do that, you know? Open my eyes. Open your eyes, for goodness sake, you know. You close your eyes and you want God to open it. We, we sing songs that we have no idea what we are saying about. Our religion had turned into superstition. We need to go back to who Jesus is. So now, going back to the question, uh, who is this Jesus that uh, we are celebrating today? That question is not just an intellectual one, okay? Because uh, there, are, there are two very important questions. Who is this Jesus? Spirit asked them. And, and depending on how you answer that question is how you will answer the, question, the second question. The second most important question in the Bible, is, first most important question is, who is Jesus? The second most important question in the Bible is, what do I do with him? That's what Pilate asked, right? Well, he is this, he is that. So what do I do with him? They cried out, crucify him. Listen, what you believe about Jesus will determine what you do with him. Okay? That is going to determine. Look, who is Anna to me? She is my wife. I, can, I, I look at her and I say, that woman is my wife. Therefore, she is the only one that I treat as my wife. I don't kiss anybody else. I don't sleep with anybody else. My eyes is just on her because I identify her as my wife. Who is Jesus to you? Okay? How do you answer that question? Is Jesus Lord over your life? That's what, that was a question. <laughs> You're looking at me like... There's a question mark at the end, okay? <laughs> is Jesus Lord over your life? No. So now, if Jesus is Lord over your life, what do you do with your Lord? Only two important questions. What do you do with, 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 with You know, I am father to my children. What do they do with me? If I am father, do they listen to me? There's a movie that I, I watched with my son before, and I forgot the title of that movie a long time ago, but uh, it gives a statement that I wrote down. Do not uh, forget the face of your father. Okay, do not forget the face of your father. And, 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 and some, some kids, they forget the face of their father. And uh, their father is there, and they disrespect them in public. Their mother is there, they disrespect them in public. Well, I thought that's your mother. If that's your mother, then you will give her due respect. You know? Are you listening? Uh, they get old. I mean, I, I really don't, don't, don't like this Filipino practice, and I don't care if you guys are doing it. Your mom got old after giving birth to you and raising you up, 
And so she already got old, and after she got old, you pretend you are petitioning for her, only to make her your babysitter. I thought that was your mother, not your babysitter. You forgot that she is your mother. You now think that, you're, that, that she is your babysitter. And after your baby grow old, you kick her out of the house. Why? Because she's just a babysitter, not a mother. Well, you might as well tell your mother, I'm hiring her as a babysitter, at least pay her per hour. But you don't even pay her per hour. Whoa. Merry Christmas. You know. But that is what's happening right now. We, we forget what kind of relationship we have. Who is Jesus to you? Okay. Who is Jesus to you? Because the way you answer that question is the way you will relate with him. Okay. Now, in the times of Pilate, because they believe that Jesus is a false teacher and a false prophet, they just simply say, crucify him. If the Jesus we are celebrating in this, in this season is the same Jesus who was born on a manger, what do we do with him? You know, I ask my pastor friends all over, and this is what they tell me. That during Christmas season, their, their biggest offering comes because uh, some people have bonuses and everything else. And I told him, you know, it's odd. Some of the uh, lowest offering that I have is during Christmas season. Considering I don't do what most pastors do. For example, most churches, during Christmas, they collect a special offering for the bonus of the pastor. I don't do that. You know, I give bonus to my staff. I don't ask for extra offering. I save money for that, okay? So I, I, don't, I don't think I should be asking for that. I think that's, for me, that's too beggarly, you know? So I don't do that. I just collect one offering all, all, all year long. But, but, but I said, whoa, you know, really? So, so how, how if, if it's the same Jesus that the three kings, the three kings, the three wise men met, problem is this. We read that story and we think that the three wise men uh, were looking at a baby Jesus. Well, when Jesus was born, the star appeared, they traveled for at least a year or two. So when, when they saw Jesus, he was no longer in a manger. You know where you will find the story that the three wise men found Jesus in a manger? You know where that is? In the Christmas cards. That's it. There's no historical Verification to that. Impossible. The ones who saw Jesus as a baby were the shepherds. Um, so now if we believe that Jesus is the same Jesus that was born in a manger, hey, what do you bring to him? If, if we are celebrating uh, his birth, what do you bring to him? Because the wise men, I don't know how many they are, but the wise men brought their gifts. Okay? The shepherds I don't know what they bring. Maybe they brought some sheep and cooked some caldereta, you know. But, but we don't know what they bring. But this is how you relate with Jesus. Now, what, what were the expectations before Jesus was born? We, it's good that we just finished the book of Daniel. They were really looking for the Messiah who will deliver them from oppression, from a foreign power. Now, during that time, the world for the Jews, because to the Jews first and also to the Greeks or the Gentiles, okay? Now, the world was in darkness. The last prophet before the Baptist show up was, was Malachi. Almost 300 years of silence. Historically, they found out that within that period, Malachi up to the 4th century BC, there were so many false religions that were born. So many cases of demon possession, okay? I mean, the world was in chaos. The world was in darkness. There's a book published, two books actually, Where Was God When World Religions Were Born? Every time God is doing something, the devil is doing something somewhere else. Uh, like during, during the times of Daniel, I think uh, Zoroastrianism, the one in Iran, is growing so much. Um, whatever God is doing, the enemy is trying to do something to counter what God is doing. And so now when you, when, when you begin to look at that, the world was in total darkness. And Jesus was born. 
That's why the Jews could not accept him because they were in so much oppression, they wanted to be set free from the Roman clause. But Jesus did not do that. And so they wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him because he refused to be installed as a king because he came as a savior. Now, this was the time when Jews came. The apostles and the disciples received Jesus as the promised Messiah. What, what did they do when they received Jesus as the promised Messiah? They followed him. You know, this is the interesting thing. I can understand when you invite an unbeliever. When you tell an unbeliever, hey, go to church. That I can understand. What I don't understand is when you have to invite a Christian to come to church. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Why in the world do you have to invite a Christian to come to church? Well, let's go back to the first century, right? So the apostles found Jesus to be the Messiah. You know what they did? They followed him. Jesus did not follow them. That's a simple statement. They followed Jesus. Because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they followed him. By the way, they have no jeepneys, no Sari Sari stores. So if Jesus is going to go to a place to teach, like an open field. By the way, Jesus did not teach like most pastors today. He doesn't teach for 15 minutes. Nobody will come to him if he only teaches for 15 minutes. You know why? Because they walk for three hours. They walk for two hours. Can you imagine walking for three hours and after 15 minutes the service is done? And Jesus did not just teach. After he teach, of course he prays for the sake, he does all of these things. But he entertained a lot of questions. It was an ongoing discussion. In fact, even when he is walking, going to the next uh, missions, mission place, he will be asking questions. So for you to follow Jesus, it's discipleship. You have to say, well, I am going to spend a day or two following Jesus. I'm going to finish all of my household chores. I'm going to finish all of my work. I'm going to bring some food. Okay? I'm going to pack some lunch so that I can stay the whole day with Jesus, and I'm going to bring some offering. Traveling rabbis are like that. They survive by the offerings. So there is a box. Uh, Judas was his treasurer, and he collected so much money that Judas was even able to buy a piece of land without the knowledge of the other apostles. But you have to be committed to listen. You have to follow him. That's why the Bible says when they found that he was, when, when, that he was on the other side of the lake, they run. They run to, to find him in the other side of the lake. Those who believe who Jesus was, they followed him. That's why it is interesting to me that right now we want Jesus to follow us. If you are all really Christians, then you should spend more time inviting me. You are already born again for goodness sake. You are supposed to be following Jesus. Jesus is not supposed to be following you. Are you listening? But this is the Christianity that we have right now. We want Jesus to follow us. We want Jesus to babysit us. That's not Jesus. We follow, we are waiting for the Messiah, we are waiting for the Savior, we found the Savior, we follow him. That's what the disciples did. And so when Jesus said, unless you leave everything, you are not worthy of me, people were already doing that, and that was the belief of that day. We also have our own expectation of the Messiah. Okay? That's why I, you, you really have to be very careful when you make altar calls. Because the Jews believe that the Messiah will come, even today, especially today, that he will be a warrior Messiah. He will, he will break the oppression of the foreign powers and let the, the nation of Israel be free. That is their expectation. What is your expectation? Why, did you, why do you believe in Jesus? That's why our altar calls has to be very critical. I mean, some people give an altar call. If you want to be, to be free from your debts and you want to prosper and be rich, receive Jesus. That is not in the Bible. A lot of Christians die poor. In fact, not only did a lot of Christians die poor, some Christians, whatever they have, were taken away from them. Well, if you are dying and you are terminally ill, give your life to Jesus and he will heal you. That is not an altar call in the Bible either. Now, Jesus heals the sick, but that is never an altar call because there are some believers in the Bible who died sick, okay? And some people say, well, if, if you're going to receive Jesus, uh, everything is going to be all right. 
It's going to be peaceful. No, there are struggles and there are sufferings. Paul was beheaded by Nero. You know, you know how, how, uh, how, how Timothy probably died. He, he died at, uh, I, I think, depending on what you're reading, maybe the, around 1992 AD. That's when they say Timothy probably died. They drug him in the streets of Ephesus, they say, and they beat him to death. That's Timothy, the timid one. They drag him in the streets of Ephesus and beat him to death. Here's a question. You see, now, there will be no altar call saying, you want to suffer with Jesus, give your life to him. That, that will be a very uh, horrendous altar call. But what I'm saying is the moment you become a Christian, there are certain expectations. Your expectation has got to be according to the scriptures. Okay? Because, of course, uh, what should be your expectation? The expectation is this. John the Baptist came here, you know. And when he started preaching, he said this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay? When Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is here. It has come. He said, if I drive out devils because of the power of God, then the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is here. So the Baptist was announcing the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus announced it's here. So what's, let, let's talk about one expectation because we are celebrating Christmas. What, what should be our expectation? The kingdom of God is here. Let me read to you a few passages. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Look at this. He did not just, just simply say, The kingdom of heaven is here. He said, Hey, the kingdom of heaven is here. For you to see it, repent. Change the way you think about certain things. Turn around. Turn around. Turn your life around. Because the kingdom of heaven is already here. The uh, guerrillas in the Philippines, when... When, when MacArthur was, uh, was touched here, they were hiding in the mountains, doing guerrilla warfare. They are trying to, to, to strengthen themselves and, and somehow retard the movement of the Japanese until MacArthur came. But when MacArthur came, they rallied around him and went full force to overthrow. They were no longer just hiding in the mountains. They came down and they started fighting with, uh, with, with General MacArthur. And so... The requirement is this. The kingdom of heaven is here. Repent. Therefore, if we are celebrating Jesus, the same Jesus this Christmas, we should be in that mode of repentance. Because we will not be able to participate in the kingdom of God unless we repent. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So when Jesus came, he said, kingdom of God is here. So he began teaching the kingdom of God or the rule of God. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He said it's fulfilled. When he says come near, what he also meant, you can, you can tally it with other scriptures, meaning it's here. Because it's, he said, it's fulfilled. What is the fulfillment? The coming of the kingdom. So the Jesus we celebrate is the king of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God with him. In fact, Jesus is the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to, to, to keep that uh, in, in your hearts, okay? When Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus is the kingdom of God. That's a very important statement that I would like you to, to keep in mind. Because Jesus brings the kingdom of God to us in his own unique way. Jesus and the kingdom of God are inseparable. You cannot talk about Jesus without talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus is also the one who guides us into the breath and the beauty of the kingdom. If somebody will show to us what the kingdom of God is, it's Jesus. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but we will be eating uh, and drinking later. Soda and water, okay? 
Um, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Is Jesus your Lord? No. That means you have the kingdom of God. Are you listening? If you have the kingdom of God, then you have righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, I, uh, I was laughing with my wife earlier because uh, we were singing the song, Joy to the World, right? Did we sing that song, Joy to the World? Now, look at this. We sang the song, Joy to the World, right? This, this will be a good question. I want you to think back. What's the facial expressions of our worship leaders when they were singing that song? Don't verbalize it, just think. I said, think. Now, you thought about their facial expressions when we're singing Joy the World, right? Now, think about your facial expressions. I mean, Joy to the World. Wow. You are really joyful. You know? This is what I'm saying. We sing songs we don't even know what it means. And sometimes we are celebrating a Jesus we don't know. If, if you are singing joy to the world, there's going to be some joy in your expression, right? Amen? That's an easy question. The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness and joy. Therefore, we already tackle joy. If the kingdom of God is in you, then you have righteousness. Amen? I'm not saying you're not making mistakes, you're not sinning, but I'm saying you are living right. Because some people just concentrate on, well, righteousness, I have right standing before God. But righteousness, when we talk about righteousness in the Bible, there's always two dimensions there. Relationship before the Lord and relationship before men. That's why we are told to have good reputation. That's righteousness before men. What about peace? Some people, you know, they are on their way to church. You know why? They look like they're ready to die. In, in communist Russia, they, uh, in Soviet Russia, they, they allowed some Christians to have pre-exercise of their faith. You know who are these? The old people. They don't like the young people to become clear, but the old people, those who are old and dying, oh, they want them to go to church. Why? Because they are old and dying. What do you get from them? Nothing. Are they, are they going to go around the world and preach the gospel? No. You know, they, they cannot. They, they are old. They are ready to die. So they allow the, the, the old and the dying to celebrate Christianity because they don't know how to celebrate anyways. They don't know how to, how, how to, how to share the gospel. But the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Meaning, if we are celebrating Jesus in this season, then we are celebrating righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay? Now, Jesus also told us how to enter that kingdom. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Say born again. born again. Born again is not a religion. Look, look at this statement. Unless a man is born again. That's the condition. Okay? That's the condition. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see what? What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, and joy. So unless a man is born again, he cannot see what? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Are you born again? Oh, can you see righteousness, peace, and joy? You see, when, 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 Christian, when, when you begin to teach, well, uh, homosexuality is an abomination, Lord, I don't see that. Well, I agree, you don't see that. I see that, I'm born again. Because unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, when I talk about respecting your parents, I'm talking about respectful the elders, I'm talking about following the law that is not sinful or in violation against God. I'm talking about purity. You know what that is? That's righteousness. I don't see that. That's archaic. I know you don't see that. 
because probably you're not born again. Because Jesus came to take our sins away. The moment sins are taken away, now comes righteousness, peace, and joy. If you live in sin, you will not know righteousness. You will not know peace. You will not know joy. But if you have God, then you have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Therefore, if we really want to learn what the kingdom of God is, we have to look at Jesus. If we also want to understand who Jesus really is, we need to experience the kingdom. Okay? We need to experience the kingdom. If you want to. Now understand, uh, understand this. You understand a person partially, because it's a bad illustration, very short, if you know his citizenship. You know, they, they say that, uh, Pastor Jin tells me this, because he's Asian, he's Korean, uh, but Pastor Jin is very direct. He will talk to his Korean friends and he says, I'm American. That's what he will say. And he will tell me that. Well, Pastor say, you know, I'm an American. Well, he's an American. Okay? But he looks Korean. Just like, look, look around. How do you guys look like? How do you guys look like? Filipino. Well, he doesn't look like Filipino. <laughs> well, you look almost like Filipino, you know? <laughs> Because, because uh, of, of uh, the, the relationship that we had for, for almost 400 years. But, but look at this. But if I look at DJ, I'm looking at the Filipino. If I don't know her, I will not understand her. She doesn't act Filipino 100%. No way. Have you noticed some of your kids? They are very American. The look on the outside, oh, Filipino. Can you imagine they like eating pizza? What in the world is that? You know, my, my kids will tell me, can we choose dinner tonight? I said, why pizza? What? I don't like pizza. You know, I, I don't understand the way Americans love pizza. Oh, because they are Americans. Even if their pizza is adulterated pizza, you know. It's not the real pizza, but hey, it's an American pizza. They worship football. It's not going to work for Filipinos. You bring football in the Philippines, they'll kill each other. That's what they're going to do. It's illegal, you know. Uh, but the same thing with the kingdom of God. The moment you belong to the kingdom of God, that's your citizenship. How do you know? By how we talk by how we act, you know. Oh, the, the first time I was here, the first driving I had, few meters in the regular city street, I went to the interstate right away. That's my first driving. I bought my first car, and I went to the interstate right away. Oh, I love the interstate. Big road, you know. <laughs> Four lanes. I, do, I was beside myself. I don't know what to do. So I drove like a Filipino. Wow! And an old lady drove side by side with me. Stay in your lane. That's what she was. She's an American. If you're a Filipino, you make your lane. <laughs> yeah? Now, the Americans may not like it, but I'll tell you this. Americans, you think you can drive. You don't know how to drive. You know, we Filipinos, oh, we know how to drive. Because we will make a lane when there is no lane, you know? <laughs> and by the way, our traffic lights, they are suggestions, okay? They, they are <laughs> it's just a suggestion. Oh, but the better drivers, I'm telling you, the Hong Kong taxi drivers, they're a, they're a sight to behold. A Hong Kong taxi driver, four cell phones. They will all be ringing at the same time. And he will answer all of them while talking with the passenger. How do you do that? I have no idea. Yeah, but they are very good drivers. Now, you identify them. You go to a restaurant. How do you know it's a good Chinese restaurant? Huh? Everybody's Chinese. <laughs> 
It's very noisy. If you go to a Chinese restaurant and it's quiet, get out of there. It's not a good restaurant. Chinese restaurants, they are always, they are shouting at each other. Have you seen the Chinese, how, how they give orders? Americans are different. Can I have this, please? Oh, not in the Chinese. I want this! <laughs> you know, I, whenever I'm brother, with Brother Willie and we're in a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, and he's ordering it, hey, I want this. Oh, this too. Okay, bayan. I mean, no, no respect at all, you know. But America, America, can I, have, can I please have this? Oh, no, please, please. Hola, yun. You know, different cultures. Different cultures. You are in Hong Kong, how do you know if it's a mainlander or a honky? If the one walking on the street doesn't have any rules, it's mainlander. They are, they are hated by the honkies. They don't follow rules. But if it follows the rules, it's from Hong Kong. You see, you, you will know them. How do you know you are in the kingdom of God? You see? If you are celebrating Jesus this Christmas, he brings the kingdom of God. How do you know you are in the kingdom of God? How do you talk? How do you live? You can even tell if a person is a religious person by how he talks. You know, a religious person comes along and says, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Jesus doesn't talk like that. Paul doesn't talk like that. I mean, Jesus was preaching and he looked at them and said, You whitewashed sepulchers. Can you imagine a preacher today preaching like that? They'll be kicked out of the church. But Jesus preached like that. You see? He brought the kingdom of God. And it's a warfare. There's violence involved in the spiritual realm. So you understand a person, what his citizenship and vice versa, by how he lives. Okay? So if we are celebrating Jesus, we are celebrating the kingdom of God, therefore we need to understand that kingdom of God. Well, the New Testament did not really give us the definition of the kingdom of God, okay? We already said righteousness, peace, and joy, but it never really defined it. Whenever something is not defined in the Bible, it's not defined because it's assumed that the listeners understand, okay? DJ is doing her best to study Tagalog, you know, and I told her, so many times her Tagalog is stinks, you know. Uh, she's giving, I said, Tagalog a very bad reputation. But because she is a learner, she's learning a lot, I will say something, and she will say, I thought the word means like this, and it will upset me. Because she is trying to explain to me something that if you are a Filipino, I don't need to explain to you. You know. I can tell all the boys, mahal ko kayo. Okay? You translate it in English, I love you all. Right? Mahalo kayo. But I can't look at the boy and say, iniibig kita. <laughs> Patay tayo dyan talaga. Bakla ang labas. Diba? How do you translate iniibig kita? I love you also. Same translation, different meaning. But if you are a Filipino, you understand, it doesn't need to be explained. Same thing in the Bible. The kingdom of God was not explained because they understood it. Not only were there monarchies, a kingdom is a king with a domain. The king makes the rules. Those that he, is, he has dominion over follows the rules. That's what the kingdom of God is. So when he says, the kingdom of God is here, what he's saying is, I am the king. I make the rules. That's why it's funny when he says, why did you heal, why did you heal during the Sabbath? I can translate some of the response of Jesus in a colloquial form. I would just simply translate this way. Who cares? I'm the king. I want to heal him during the Sabbath. What, what, what are you going to do about it? That's what it is. Well, the Bible, the, the scripture says this, and Jesus will say, I wrote that. I inspired that. This is what it means. You heard it has been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And you thought adultery is just having sex. But I'm telling you, if you look at the woman with the last, you already committed adultery. 
That's too much. Who cares? I'm the king. They understood that. Oh, that's the problem with us in the Western world. We don't understand this. You know why? We think we have to vote on everything. We even vote as to who is the most beautiful woman in the world. How can you vote that? We call her Miss Universe or Miss World or whoever he is. But this is the kingdom of God. There is a king and he has a domain. Now, <clears throat> uh, therefore, the kingdom of God is a realm of God. It's, the re it's a realm where God reigns. That's why the kingdom of God is here. Even though it is here, living in Chicago, one of the most progressive communities in the U.S., if we are in the kingdom of God, we don't follow the rules, the progressive rules of Chicago. We pay taxes because that's what the Bible says. But anything that Chicago says that is opposite to the word of the Lord, to the word of the king of the kingdom, we don't have to follow. Therefore, for over 100 years, the, the term kingdom of God has been commonly understood as the rule of God. Jesus is Lord because he rules over the kingdom. By the way, when you say, Jesus is Lord, Lord is a monarchical term, right? That's why in England, Lord of Suffolk, Lord of Essex, it's, it's a kingdom thing. There are no lords in the U.S. because this is not a monarchy. This is a republic, okay? But the kingdom of God is a kingdom. So look, Abraham was addressed by Sarah as her Lord. The Western mind is offended by that because a Lord dictates, but the Lord provides. You see, the Lord protects. That's why the man of the house, the Lord of the house, protects and provides. You see, now in the West, we don't understand. How dare you call yourself this? Because you are living in a democracy. You are living in a republic. So what we celebrate when we say Jesus is Lord is, you are Lord of the kingdom. Lord, I don't make the rules. I just follow the rules. One of the best ways to celebrate Jesus during Christmas is make sure we align ourselves. We are following the rules. Now, one, one of the difficulties that we have in entering into the kingdom of God is in practical application. Unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom, he will not enter the kingdom of God, he will not see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you will not see this. Okay? A lot of people, uh, a lot of people understand the concept of the kingdom. But they don't understand its application. Now, this is the problem because modern man, Western mentality, especially philosophy, we like understanding concepts, okay? We don't like applying the concepts. We understand the concepts. We don't like applying the concepts. John was driving me to church early this morning. We were by Mariano's. It's red light. You know, both ways red light. And this car just drove through the red light. And I, uh, uh, John and I were talking, I said, most probably he's late, his wife is waiting for him, you know. I said, or maybe he's drunk. Because have you noticed in America, now I don't, I don't have this when I was in the Philippines. In America, the moment you see red light, without thinking, what do you want to do? To stop. If you see red light and what you want to do is to go, that's Filipino. Oh, in Philippines, you don't just go. You see a red light, first you look around, is there a police? If there's no police, you go. <laughs> That's Filipino. But in America, the moment it's, it's red, you stop. You stop. That's the kind. We can explain all of that. I learned traffic rules in the Philippines when I was in elementary using American books. But Filipinos don't follow it. Okay? We understand the concept but not the practical application. If we are going to celebrate Jesus, we need oh, the practical application. Okay. For example, kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Uh, look. Jesus went around 
healing the sick. Right? Right or wrong? We understand the concept of healing. Jesus heals the sick. Do we know its practical application? Do we know how to live healthy? Do we know how to live healed? Ah, by the way, prosperity. Let's understand. Uh, the, the Bible says, when I, when I started praying this, I was laughing while praying because when I started seeing this in the scriptures, especially when we were, when we were studying the book of uh, Daniel. One of these passages that I imported was the passage that says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob. Okay, that's in the millennial reign. So I told you guys, we think we understand prosperity. We don't. Because when God will restore the fortunes of Jacob, that's physical fortune. You don't need to be rich in heaven. Everybody is rich there. Therefore, nobody is rich. If everybody is the same, nobody is rich. Nobody is higher than the other. Okay? It's a, it's a uh, comparative terminology. If we are all millionaires, there are no millionaires, so to speak. If, if we are all healthy, nobody is going to... If we are all... If there's no sickness, nobody will take medicine. Uh, nobody will, will, will have a course in, in, in medical technology or something like that. Because we are all healthy. We don't understand that. So when we're studying that God will restore the fortunes of Jacob, I, I, I'm coming to my mind, boy, all the offerings of the world will go to Jerusalem. It's a very small city. It's going to be extremely prosperous. The citizens who survive the Great Tribulation will be very wealthy. What did he say? I will restore the fortunes of Jacob. Now, the word restore means something was stored there. It was removed. It's just going to be put back. So I was praying. I said, Lord, how do I understand wealth then? I cannot pray to the Lord, Lord, restore my wealth. I had no wealth. I mean, anybody here, can you consider yourself wealthy before? Maybe you think you're wealthy. <laughs> Thinking you're wealthy is different from being wealthy. Are you listening to me? We have the concept of wealth. That's why some people, you get a little bit of money, you buy this, brand new this, brand new that, because you thought you are wealthy. You didn't realize, you buy one big item, all is gone. And you're back in debt. Because you are not wealthy. You know what a wealthy person is in the Bible? With abundance overflowing. A lot to spare. That's abundance in the Bible. That's why in the times of uh, Solomon, silver became common. Oh, there's an abundance of gold. I mean, this guy was filthy rich. You see? So I was praying that scripture says, Oh Lord, restore the fortunes of Jacob. Restore my fortunes. I stopped. I said, Wow, I don't understand that, I told the Lord. I said, I, I don't know how it is to be wealthy. Anybody here wants to know how to be wealthy? I don't know how to be wealthy. Now, God is prospering me. I have all my needs. I don't know how to be wealthy. I grew up poor. And I stopped in my prayer and said, Wow, I don't know how to be wealthy. <laughs> I just don't. I have dined with wealthy people, and I'm telling you, they behave differently. I don't know how to be wealthy. Although I believe God is prospering me, I have, I have more than enough. I am not, I don't know how to be wealthy. You see? I just don't. Anybody here knows how to be wealthy? So I started directing my prayer. I said, Lord, can you teach me how to be wealthy? <laughs> he cannot restore my fortunes unless I have fortunes. I had no fortunes. Nothing. There's nothing to restore. <laughs> I'm not Jewish. I, I've been Philippines. There's no fortune to restore in the Philippines. Well, we have minerals. We don't know they are minerals. All we know back then, perhaps, is how to plant camote. We don't know what fortune is. People are fighting about, oh, there's oil in the West Philippine Sea. We don't know there was oil there. We did not explore that. It's the foreigners who explore that. Unless they told us there is oil, we wouldn't know there is oil. You see? And some of us, do you know the concept of living healthy life? We grew up getting sick. I, I rarely get sick. 
but I always get sick. I don't remember a year I was never, I never got sick. But I was looking at the nation of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. None was feeble. None was weak. Nobody was sick. Do you, do you even understand the concept? To have 40 years where you don't need a doctor? You don't need to concoct any medicine? That's far from my imagination. But that is what Jesus brought. Because he came to save us from our sins. And the counsel of salvation, the Greek word salzo, it means not only being born again, but it includes financial prosperity. It includes physical healing. That's why some, some denominations, they drop healing because they, they don't see the same Jesus. Now, can you imagine being given by the Lord wisdom? This is prosperity, okay? I'll, I'll tell you biblical prosperity. God spoke to Joshua and said, every place you set your foot, that's yours. Can you imagine you start a business, it prospers, it's yours? And so when we start a business, it goes south, it's not ours. We don't understand the concept of prosperity. That's why I got stuck in that prayer. When I, I was praying, Lord, restore the fortunes of Jacob. Lord, restore my fortune. I stopped, I said, whoa. I had no fortunes. <laughs> I don't even know how to be wealthy. You see? Any of you here knows how to be wealthy? You think you're wealthy, but you wake up very late in the morning trying to catch up some customers and work because you will have no money if you don't. You're afraid you're going to be fired by the... A wealthy person is not afraid of those things because you are wealthy. You own the business. You have enough money. It overflows. Nobody can threaten you. I'll fire you because you will just smile and walk away. You're wealthy. Are you listening? Now, can you imagine if we begin to touch that concept? Jesus said, the kingdom of God is here. Huh? What about a prosperous family? Do we even understand that concept? Oh, righteousness, I can dwell in it forever. I mean, the concept that Paul got, and I got stuck on Paul on this one, because Paul got a hold of this revelation, you can overcome sin. You are not a slave to it anymore. You are a master of it. You know the difference between a slave and a master? The master gives the order, the slave obeys. And if you don't understand righteousness, you are a slave to sin. Meaning whenever sin calls, you say, yes, sir, because you're still a slave. But the moment you get born again, you master it. That's what the, the command is. Master it. That's what Paul says. We become masters of sin. We don't have to obey it. Oh, I don't understand that exactly. That's why you need to claim, Lord, I am born again. You say you can't see the kingdom of God. Let me see it. Let me, see, let me live like a kingdom person. And the moment you live like a kingdom person, one of the questions asked to me earlier last, last Friday was, Pastor, say you claim that your kids are now grown up and your quiver is full. Yes, it is. We say live by kingdom rules. Discipline your kids. I discipline them. Put them in their place. I teach them. I provide. Now my, my, my kids are, are very helpful to me. I mean, they, they are very helpful to me. I'm, I'm enjoying my life in my, in my advanced years, you know. Uh, and I listen to some of your complaints. I don't have that. Because I follow kingdom rules. My wife was telling me uh, years ago, do you really expect me to submit to you? Do you really expect me to do what you tell me to do? My wife told me that. I look at her with a smile and say, yes, of course. That's, that's it. I just look at my wife and said, yeah. You expect me to follow you all the time? I said, yeah. No, I said, yeah. I expect that. Why? I'm the head of the house. She is not. Now, do I abuse her? No. She may think I am abusing her, but I really don't, you know. But this is living kingdom rule. Nothing makes you afraid. Are there some things that makes me afraid? Yes, I'm still exploring it. That's why I'm telling you, I'm enjoying that prayer. Lord, I don't know that word, restoring the fortunes of Jacob. I, I never had fortune. And so I started praying, God, teach me how to walk in this kind of provision. 
you know. Amen? Merry Christmas. Praise God. We will continue this tonight. Let's all stand. Hallelujah.